We're about the fourth study, I think, in Ephesians 2 and 10, so uh, we're coming to the end of this great verse. Ephesians 2 and 10, for it's page 1017, uh, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. You remember we've said that what God is saying plainly to us is that we were created not primarily in our mothers, but we were created in Christ Jesus. And I just mentioned that to you again, that it's important to think about that for a moment or two and really grasp it and rise to it, because I think there's something inside us uh, that I think it's Bart says, wants to sink back into ourselves, you know, into our comfortable little selves and think primarily of ourselves as Lucy Blomfield or Sandra Tom Cech or Ernest O'Neill. And uh, instead of that, of course, the reality is that we were created not primarily in our mothers, whom God just used as a way of getting us into this physical world, but we were created in Christ Jesus and we are part of Jesus. And we only help our own perception of reality if we really do fix our minds on that and say, yes, I am part of Jesus. I have been created in him, and he is my true father, and he is the world in which I live, and he is the heart of all my life. And that's what this verse says, that we were created in Christ Jesus, and then not for our own personal experience, primarily. Not primarily for our own personal mystical experience. Because I think that's a temptation for all of us, to get utterly preoccupied with this truth that we are in Jesus, and to get utterly preoccupied with what it feels like to be in Jesus, or can I feel I'm in Jesus? Or can I see Jesus? I remember one dear fellow, Hank Arndt, I don't know if you remember him, uh, just a very ordinary American guy. But when I look back, I'm sorry for him because he would say to me, Pastor, how can you see Jesus, you know? And there I would try, of course, to explain to him how he could see Jesus. The dear fellow, of course, was just taking very literally our terminology, but I do think it's easy to get preoccupied with that. It's easy to get preoccupied with, do I feel Jesus' presence? Do I really feel as if I am in Jesus? Do I really feel God here? And of course, the verse very clearly says we were created in Christ Jesus, not primarily for our own subjective experience, not primarily to sense God's presence. But we were created in Christ Jesus for a very practical purpose, for good works. We were created in Christ Jesus for good works. And uh, I think we've talked about that now, not works of law, not works that we do to try to prove that we are not autonomous and that we are in God, but good works works that stem from our being safe in Christ. And I just remind you of that. You remember that, that uh, Romans 7, well, Romans 7 puts it very clearly if you, if you look at it. Uh, Romans 7, and particularly there from, from verse 7, Romans 7, verse 7. What then shall we say? That the law is sin? By no means. If it, yet if it had not been for the law, I should not have known sin. I should not have known what it is to covet if the law had not said you shall not covet. But sin, finding opportunity in the commandment, wrought in me all kinds of covetousness. Apart from the law, sin lies dead. Do you remember what Paul is trying to bring out clearly to us is that works of law are really works that we do 
to try to prove to ourselves that we are truly in Christ and we are truly dependent upon him and we are truly trusting in him. And of course, the more we try to do those works, the more the law exposes to us that we are autonomous and that we are living independent and they are, we are not deeply trusting in him. And the more clearly it is, the more clear it is to us that the sin is exceedingly sinful. So sin is the desire to live on our own, the desire to be apart from God, the desire to be autonomous. And that in its turn produces sins, produces covetousness, produces anxiety. And the law speaks to us and says those things are wrong. And then, of course, if we try to overcome those without trusting deeply in God and sinking deeply into Jesus, we in fact compound our sin. And so that's what Paul is saying here. The law said to him, you shall not covet. And suddenly he became aware that he was coveting. And not only that, but that the coveting came because he felt he needed something that he didn't have. And he felt he needed it because he was not resting in God who saw it supplies everything to him. So it's important maybe for us to see that the purpose of the law is to show us not that we're coveting, not that we're stealing, but the reason why we're coveting and the reason why we're stealing, that we're not trusting deeply in God. But of course, our reaction often is the opposite. Our reaction often is, oh, I must prove that I am in God. So even though I do steal, even though I covet, even though I bear false witness against my neighbor, even though I do have other gods beside God, yet I have to prove that I don't do those things and that I am in God even though I am not. So that's, that's I think, what we shared last day, that the purpose of the law is to expose sin. But so often our response to the law is to try to obey it while we still remain in sin. And so that's what he goes on to say, you see, in verse 9. I was once alive apart from the law. But when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. In other words, law provoked my sin, my desire to show that I was on my own, independent of God, and could live that way very successfully. The very commandment which promised life proved to be death to me. For sin, finding opportunity in the commandment, deceived me, and by it killed me. So the law is holy, and the commandment is holy and just and good. Did that which is good then bring death to me? By no means. It was sin, my own autonomy, my own living on my own, my own incorrigible independence of God. I don't know, maybe that's the word for it, you know, is it? Our own incorrigible independence of God. I don't know if you've felt that, you know, you've, you've felt Yes, I, I want to depend upon him. I want to trust in him. But there's something in me that just won't let go. There's something in me that won't let go. I, I have this grim grip on my life because I think that I alone can run it. I alone can supply what I need. And it's as if it's an incorrigible independence of God you know, that we have. Did that which is good then bring death to me? By no means. It was sin working death in me through what is good in order that sin might be shown to be sin and through the commandment might become sinful beyond measure. And that's the purpose of the law. Not really to get us to obey it, but to show us that we're not only not obeying it, but that our own attitude to God is utterly and completely wrong. So that sin becomes exceedingly sinful. And of course, you know the response that we can so often produce ourselves to that. We just get mad. We get mad with it. We say, well, I can't do it. I can't do it. I can't do what I ought to do. And of course, that's exactly what the law is trying to do, is trying to bring us to a conviction that that is the situation. But so often, of course, we hang on and we say, but I'm going to try, I'm going to try. And we keep on trying 
Because you remember C.S. Lewis says, we would off, we would do anything to keep ourselves alive. We'll do anything. If we can only hold on to a little of self, we'll do anything to hold on to a little of self. And then he says, you know, no, Jesus says you must be perfect. Your yeah, Father in heaven is perfect. He'll put off, he'll accept nothing but perfection. And of course, we so often, we'll accept anything but the total loss of ourselves. And so that's what Paul is getting at here. We know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. I do not understand my own actions, for I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. Now, if I do what I do not want, I agree that the law is good. So then it is no longer I that do it, but sin which dwells within me. For I know that nothing good dwells within me. That is in my flesh. I can will what is right, but I cannot do it. For I do not do the good I want but the evil I do not want is what I do. And that's what we mean here in this verse, Ephesians 2 and 10, when we say, we were created in Christ Jesus for good works, not for works of law, not for that striving and straining to try to prove that we are deeply in Christ and dependent on God, even though we're not but we were created for good works, works that flow from our being in Jesus. Good works are works done not to get saved, but that come from our being saved in Jesus. And we're created for good works, works that will stem from our trust and our oneness with Christ. And that's really the heart of it, you know. And you remember we, we tried to emphasize it uh, a, a little by looking up a couple of verses. Uh, one of them, uh, I, I think, is uh, Philippians 4 and verse 4. Philippians 4 and verse 4. This may be one of... In a way, it's law, you know, it's not put as law, but in a way, it's part of God's law. That is, it's the part of the law of his nature. And Philippians 4 and verse 4, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let all men know your forbearance. The Lord is at hand. Have no anxiety about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. And so often you and I hear those verses and we say, yes, I'm not rejoicing. I'm not rejoicing. And I should be rejoicing. And I'm not rejoicing. Oh, I, I'll have to rejoice more. I must get some joy in my life. I, I mustn't be thinking right. I, I should think of the birds and the sunshine and the bright day and think of all the good gifts, count your blessings, not, uh, name them one by one, see what the Lord has done for me. I should rejoice. And of course, that's a work of law. And in fact, the only way to rejoice is when your own heart heart rests deeply in Jesus, and so his joy surges up inside you. And that's where we left it last day, you know, that the only thing a person can do is say, Lord, I'm not rejoicing. I do not rejoice. I, I do get depressed, and I do get anxious about the money, and I get anxious about the sales, and I get anxious about my car, and I get anxious about the future. So I'm not rejoicing. I am being anxious. Lord, in what way am I still my own God? In what way am I taking charge of things that I should not take charge of and cannot? In what way, Lord Jesus, have I not accepted my crucifixion with you 
and my resurrection. That's it. You know. that's, that's the only right response when we find ourselves in this position. Because the good works that God has created us for in Christ Jesus can only come from our being in Jesus. And they only come from our resting in him. And that's where the joy comes and the freedom from anxiety comes. So we're created in Christ Jesus for good works, not for works of law. Works of law are works done by us in our own strength to try to prove that we're obeying the law and that we are deeply resting in Christ when we aren't. And it's a bit, you know, we've said it before, don't know all the symptoms of cancer or all the symptoms of all the diseases, but it's like having a disease that has certain pimples, and those are the symptoms. And it's like taking a knife and scraping the pimples off and saying, now, now I'm free from the disease. Now you see I have no disease. Well, no, you've just scraped the symptoms off, and they'll come back. The disease is what it says, dis in Latin, the suffix or the prefix is none, not, and ease, of course, not ease. Dis-ease is not ease, it's unease. It's lack of ease in Jesus. It's lack of ease in God. And from that comes other diseases that one can see. So we were created in Christ Jesus for good works, and then they wonder of the next words, you know, are just so uplifting and so saving. We are created in Christ Jesus for good works which he has prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Created in Christ Jesus for good works which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. I'd like to point out, first of all, clarify one thing for us, and you'll see it there in Matthew 21 and verse 2. Matthew 21 and verse 2. It's page 855, and it's just a very simple statement of this deep truth. You could read the verse 1, you know, Matthew 21 and 1. And when they drew near to Jerusalem and came to Bethphage, to the Mount of Olives, then Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village opposite you, and immediately you will find an ass tied and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, you shall say, the Lord has need of them, and he will send them immediately. This took place to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet, saying, Tell the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on an ass, and on a colt, the foal of an ass. The disciples went and did as Jesus had directed them. They brought the ass and the colt, and put their garments on them, and he sat thereon. You mean Jesus knew that the ass was there? And he knew what the man would say to them when they asked him for the ass? Yes, Jesus obviously did. He knew what would happen. He knew the future. And in fact, you can see in verse 5, that it's obvious that someone else knew the future. Tell the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on an ass, and on a colt, the foal of an ass. It's obvious that, well, it was Isaiah. You can see the footnote there to 21, chapter 21, verse 5, Isaiah 62 and 11 and Zechariah 9 and 9, Isaiah, uh, 800 years before, knew that this would take place. In other words, God himself knows the future. God knows the future. 
And he revealed that future not only to Isaiah, but Jesus also could see that future when he directed them to go and get the ass that he could ride in on in, in Jerusalem. So God knows the future. And God knows each one of our futures. God knows the future. He can see into the future. And that's why the verse is so real that we're studying. Good works which God has prepared beforehand that we should walk in. When you think of all the fretting and all the worrying and all the talking with vocational guidance counselors and with our teachers and with our mums and dads and with our peers, all the discussions that we entered into because we wanted to find out what we should do in our lives whether we should be teachers or nurses or doctors or social workers or dentists or doctor, whatever. But when you think of all of that, and then you read this verse, and you realize our Father has the good works prepared long beforehand that we should walk in. He has prepared them all, that he has lovingly foreseen our whole lives and has prepared everything that we are to do in our lives so that it's all laid out and it's ready. Indeed, in a deep way, in Jesus, he has lived our lives for us. Now, I'd, I'd encourage you to think about about it a little more deeply, because it's easy for us to say, oh, it's impossible, impossible, but I submit to you, it's, it's logical. It's logical. If our God has an infinite mind, and he himself is the one that created everything, that created atoms and neutrons, that thought of us, that created us human beings, that thought of the eye and the ear and how they would detect sounds and sights, if our God is able to do all those things, do you think for one moment that he has made a lot of little things and then has no idea how they're going to turn out or how they're going to work? I mean, I'd push you on it. If that is the case, uh, who is there nobody then that knows how it's going to turn out? Is there some unknown realm that God has no control over that he can throw us all into it and let something happen? Something must govern that realm. In other words, our God, of course, is the same as we are. Every manufacturer that makes a boat or a plane or a car or a pencil will give you a warranty about what that thing will do because he needs to be able to foresee what it's capable of. And as the maker, he usually can. But we're talking of God who is infinite. And of course, he has seen our whole lives and has seen them stretched out before us. And he has made plans for them all and prepared them carefully. So every work, every good work that we will ever do in our lives has been prepared by God. And every day of our lives has been prepared. Do you remember in Psalm 139 how the words are clear that every day of our lives has been written in his book before there were any of them. And so we're created for good works which God has prepared beforehand that we should walk in. And I remember reading something in Bart where, where he dealt with passivity, you know. And uh, someone said, oh, well, then I don't have to do anything. If it's all prepared beforehand, I just lie back and I let it happen. And Bart answers, 
No, all God's work presupposes our actions. God has worked that all in. God knows how we will act, and he works out what will result, and he works out how to draw us gently in his direction again. And then he sees us make a wrong decision, we turn that way, and he draws us gradually back that way, and he balances the whole thing perfectly so that our will is never steamrollered by his, but is gently drawn more and more towards him until we willingly give it completely to him. So God lovingly arranges everything so that our free wills are preserved, and yet his own will draws us continually in the way that he, in his infant wisdom, saw in a millisecond in eternity that we would go. But to me, the wonder and the beauty of it is that there is no need for one moment to worry about tomorrow. And there is no sense at all in being anxious for next week. And there is no reason for anything but relaxation and peace about the next 10 or 15 years. Because our Father has prepared all the good works for us, and all we have to do is live joyfully in those. Let us pray.